man drove the heavy construction machinery around suburban Brisbane before police finally caught up with him after he had to bail and run away on foot. No one was injured. Tonight, we are honoring a titan, a man who spent his entire adult life in service to his country. Colin Powell, the first black U.S. Secretary of State, passed away this morning after COVID complications. The tributes pouring in this evening. President Biden hailing him as a patriot of unmatched honor and dignity. Former President George W. Bush calling him a great public servant. Tonight, the three men accused of killing Georgia man Ahmad Arbery are set to go on trial. The nation bracing for an intense trial as the difficult process of selecting a jury is now underway. We are joined by Arbery's mother. Ahmad was, he was my baby boy. Ahmad was loved by many and also Ahmad loved many. The stunning kidnapping in Haiti, 16 Americans and a Canadian taken by gang members, the missionaries and their families abducted as they were leaving an orphanage. U.S. authorities now have a team on the ground trying to win their release. Marcus Moore is in Haiti for us tonight. China's surprise missile test shocking U.S. intelligence officials. The new concerns tonight over a report China tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile in secret. The incredible discovery tonight by an eagle-eyed diver spotting a 900-year-old crusader sword at the bottom of the ocean. What we're learning tonight about this ancient treasure. And all hail the queens. Our conversation with the first female hip-hop MC to release a solo album, The Legend and a Queen of Hip-Hop MC Light. Her story and rise to fame is now the subject of an ABC News special you won't want to miss. We persevere, becoming greater creators without pulling favors. Showing up, showing out, proving we could be braver. Exceeding all expectations, claiming our rightful spot in this culture called hip hop. Little taste there. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Tonight, we are remembering the life and remarkable accomplishments of one Colin Powell. The first black secretary of state passed away today from COVID complications at the age of 84, but his legacy will certainly live on. Back in 1994, while addressing graduates of Howard University, Powell said, above all, never lose faith in America. Its faults are yours to fix, not to curse. And today, 27 years after those words, there's still many reminders of the faults that still need to be fixed. In a Georgia courtroom today, jury selection began in the trial of three men accused of murdering an unarmed black man. It was an incident that shook America right at the start of the pandemic last year. Ahmaud Arbery was killed in February of 2020 while out for a jog in the small town of Brunswick, Georgia. But it wasn't until more than two months later, after graphic video was released, released and protests erupted that the three white men involved were ultimately charged and arrested. We'll get to all the tributes to Colin Powell in a moment, but we begin with Elwin Lopez on a trial that is expected to captivate the country. Hundreds of potential jurors showing up today as jury selection kicks off in the trial of three men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery. His death is sparking a national outcry going far beyond this coastal community. We all don't have to look alike. We don't all have to believe in the same beliefs, but we are so much greater together. A thousand mailboxes hit with jury duty notices. That's about one out of 85 residents in Glen County. Simply because the case is in the media doesn't mean that you can't find jurors uh, who will uh, be able to approach the, the case without you know, having already made up their minds. Prosecutors say the 25 year old was fatally shot in February of last year while he was on a jog near Brunswick, Georgia. The cries for justice amplified with people taking to the streets after this cell phone video of Arbery's final moments emerged. It appears to show Gregory and Travis McMichael chasing after Arbery. Their attorneys say they suspected he was a burglar after seeing him enter a home under construction that same day. Travis calling 911. I was leaving the neighborhood and I just caught a guy running into a um, house being built two houses down from me. Neighbor William Roddy Bryan took the video. After this brief altercation, it allegedly shows Travis shooting and killing Arbery. All right, guys, everybody's got their weapons up, correct? The immediate aftermath caught on police body camera. Arbery's body still on the ground. They start wrestling and Travis shoots him around the damn chest. He had to, the guy was trying to take the shotgun away from him. At one point, Brian claims Travis McMichael uttered a racial slur while Aubrey was on the floor. Mr. Brian said that 
after the shooting took place, before police arrival, while Mr. Aubrey was on the ground, that he heard Travis Michael make the statement. He also allegedly told authorities he tried to block Aubrey with his vehicle. Brian speaking with police. I mean, if the guy would have stopped, you know, I mean, find out what was going on, he obviously was on the way up. I mean, there. this would have never happened. Uh, okay. You know, should we have been chasing him? I don't know. We believe that Roddy it was nothing more than a witness to the shooting uh, on that day uh, and that he acted in good faith at all times. The three suspects were not arrested until more than two months later after two different district attorneys recused themselves and failed to bring charges. It wasn't until the Georgia Bureau investigation got the case and some 36 hours after this video went viral that arrest really started to happen. So it was really public pressure and outcry for the most part. The McMichaels charged on May 7th and Brian almost two weeks later. I'm tired of our kid living in fear. You know, we got kids, grandchildren, all that stuff. We got to worry about there all the future. And I'm scared right. they can't be going for a run, fearing for their life, dunking bullets. It's got to stop. Two arguments that are expected to play heavily in this case are then citizens' arrest law and whether or not the McMichaels acted in self-defense. What we're going to see here to try to beat those charges are going to be the old citizens' arrest law. And I say it's old because it has roots from the pre-Civil War era. That citizens' arrest law was just repealed in May. The jury now having to separate the past from the present. It's going to be a constant reminder from both the judge and, of course, the defense attorneys that say, hey, we know that citizens' arrest is gone. We know that the political climate changed it because of this murder. But that's something you cannot think about. And that's going to be very difficult for a lot of people because common sense would say, well, if you change this law because of the death of Ahmaud Arbery, there must have been something wrong with it. Elwin Lopez, ABC News, Brunswick, Georgia. Elwin, thank you. And now we bring in Ahmaud Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, and her family's attorney, Lee Merritt. Thank you both so much for joining us on what we can only imagine has to be a really tough and emotional day. Uh, Ms. Cooper Jones, the start of this trial, this jury selection, such a long time coming. How are you feeling now that it's finally underway? I'm very thankful of being that we started out um, the case within the dark for months, but now we finally came to picking a jury. I'm very thankful, I'm very relieved. And this is a question for both of you lawyers on both sides. We'll be looking at hundreds of potential jurors. Do you have any concerns at all about the makeup of the community or the influence that, that videotape may have on them? Well, the videotape is hard to not see. And it's going, to be, it's going to be difficult to find a group of people who say that they haven't developed an opinion about this case from the Glen County community. However, we've seen some positive voices from the Glen County community do things like uh, make sure that Jackie Johnson lost her reelection. Uh, we've seen the laws change all over Georgia, and we think that there, there's a significant group of citizens here who, who believe in justice and that we can probably get a, a fair jury together. Ms. Cooper Jones, any, any concerns for you? You say, um, I agree with Attorney Merritt um, totally. And do you think that the racial makeup of this jury will, will make a deciding difference? Yeah, we think it's important that the jury is one of our peers. Uh, the Brunswick community, where this case lies here in Glen County, is a diverse community. And so we certainly believe that there should be black and brown voices as well as white voices on the jury. And having that diversity that represents the population here probably will make all the difference. And these three men on trial will no doubt argue that they were following the citizen's arrest law that existed at that time, that they simply acted in self-defense after a confrontation began. Tell us why you think that beyond any reasonable doubt, they committed murder. Well, the citizen's arrest statute says that someone has to witness a felony taking place in, in, uh, in their view or in their immediate knowledge. Uh, moreover, it, in order to justify the use of deadly force, uh, they would have to prove, according to that same law, that Ahmaud Arbery was the, and I quote, initial aggressor, that he instigated the encounter with these men. Here, he clearly did not. He was on a run. He was minding his own business when he was accosted and eventually violently assaulted by these men. Men committing crimes like the McMichaels and Mr. Uh, Brian were cannot avail themselves of the, the self-defense statute. 
And Ms. Cooper-Jones, you've said that you plan to be at this trial every single day, and that video capturing the last moments of Ahmad's life will certainly be front and center. Uh, I'm curious to know, do you plan to watch? Do you turn away? Where do you find the strength to relive those moments? I plan to be in court every day. Um, probably not all day, but I plan to be in court every day that Ahmad's name is called. Um, as far as the video goes, I'll have to face that whenever that time comes. I'm not sure how I would take that at this time. Do you, have you watched it multiple times or is it just something you saw once and, and then that was enough? I haven't watched the, the video in its entirety. I saw some little um, clippings of it, but as far as just sitting down watching the, the, the entire video, I haven't found the strength to do that yet. And, of course, we know that Ahmad was loved by so many. As the American public watches this trial unfold in the coming weeks, what would you like people to remember most about your son? That Ahmad was, he was my baby boy. Ahmad was loved by many, and also Ahmad loved many. Ahmad just wasn't a, a, a young man who decided to go jogging on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Ahmad was a son. He was a brother. He was an uncle. He was a grandson. Uh, Ahmad was loved by so many people, and we lost him so tragically. And this question, last question for, for both of you, going into this, do you have a sense, do you feel confident that there will be a, a guilty outcome for all three men? I'm confident about the ultimate conclusion being guilty on all counts in this case. And my confidence is both in the prosecutor's office, who we think has done a great job preparing for the case, uh, but really with the community that is gathered outside of the courtroom, the organizing community, the, the people who have, an, who have a vested interest in justice, they've done so much standing for this family, standing for justice. We believe that their faith and investment will lead us all the way to the promised land, which is guilty verdicts on all counts. Ms. Cooper-Jones, that promised land idea, if convicted, do you feel that that would be justice for you? Unfortunately, it will be some sense of justice. Um, unfortunately, Ahmad won't be coming home with me after we get that verdict. But it will be satisfying knowing that the men that was responsible for Ahmad leaving me so soon will be to spend the rest of their lives in jail. Ms. Wanda Cooper Jones, Lee Merritt, we thank you so much for your time. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay. He was a prime example of the coveted American dream. Colin Powell, a first-generation American son of Jamaican immigrants, would go on to become a trailblazer. He was the first African-American to hold some of the highest positions in our government. Today, he passed away after succumbing to complications of COVID-19. ABC's Martha Raddatz brings us this report on an American legend. Tonight, the nation remembering General Colin Powell, a trailblazing leader, a diplomat, a soldier, a patriot who served as the first black secretary of state, first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and first black national security advisor. This to Ronald Reagan. Today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, the country's first black Pentagon chief, who looked to Powell as a mentor and friend, saying Powell's death leaves a hole in his heart. The world lost one of the greatest leaders that we have ever witnessed. President Biden ordering flags to be flown at half staff, saying Colin embodied the highest ideals of both warrior and diplomat, adding he put country before self, before party, before all else, in uniform and out. He's not only a dear friend and a patriot, one of our great military leaders and a man of overwhelming decency. Howell died of complications from COVID-19 at Walter Reed Medical Center. He was 84. A spokeswoman revealing Powell had been battling a rare blood cancer called multiple myeloma and Parkinson's too. Doctors say the blood cancer can weaken the immune system, making him more vulnerable, even though he was fully vaccinated. He had been scheduled for the booster right when he came down with COVID. Powell's journey was an American journey. Born to Jamaican immigrants in Harlem, Powell grew up in the Bronx, joining the Army ROTC in college, serving two combat tours in Vietnam. Powell once said when he first put on a uniform, he liked what he saw. 
Howell would soon break through barriers, becoming a four-star general, serving under four presidents, Republican and Democrat. In 1991, overseeing the successful Gulf War, when the U.S. ousted Iraqi President Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, his most controversial moment coming more than 20 years later. In 2003, as Secretary of State, during a speech to the U.N., Powell made the case for war, telling the world of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. The gravity of this moment is matched by the gravity of the threat that Iraq's weapons of mass destruction pose to the world. Those weapons did not exist. The intelligence was flawed. Telling ABC's Barbara Walters he felt terrible about the claims made in that speech. Do you think this blot on your record will stay with you for the rest of your life? Well, it's a, it's, it's a, of course it will. It's a blot. I'm the one who presented it on behalf of the United Nations, uh, United States, to the world. And it will always be uh, uh, part of my, uh, my record. How painful is that? It, it was painful. Uh, it's painful now. Tonight, former President George W. Bush calling Powell a great public servant. Bill and Hillary Clinton saying he was a courageous soldier, a skilled commander, a dedicated diplomat, and a good and decent man. President Obama saying he embodied what America can and should be. General Powell, in his own words, on a life lived. My life's been blessed because uh, I've had a chance to serve my country and uh, I, I've had a chance to do things that benefited my country. And when it's all over, I just hope they say, you know, he's a good soldier, he did a good job, raised a good family, and uh, God bless him. That's all I ask for. And likely many will remember him as he wished. Martha Raditz joins us now. Martha, you reported on Colin Powell's career from his time in the Pentagon to that moment that he gave the speech before the United Nations. How would you sum up all of those years? I, I think it's really hard to sum up, Lindsay. He was such a trailblazer and such a, a person of history in the military as a diplomat. He did so much, but I think the way I remember him is he was always humble. He was always approachable. I think that's why people liked him so much. He was so admired because he had accomplished so much, and yet they all felt that he cared for them. Yeah, that humility always on display. And Martha, many Republicans wanted Colin Powell to run for president. Of course, he never did. Both he and his wife resisted. Why do you think in the end he decided not to? Well, I think, first of all, Alma Powell did not want him to run. And I think she was very concerned about his safety, understandably. And I think in the end, Colin Powell really didn't want it. Because whenever you ask him, and I certainly ask him whether he wanted to be called secretary or whether he wanted to be called general, he'd always say, call me general. I'm a soldier at heart. And indeed he was, Lindsay. He was a very good soldier. Martha Raddatz, thanks so much. Now to the latest on the pandemic and the battle over vaccine mandates. Some California parents opposed to a future vaccine requirement for students are now taking their children out of school in protest. And it comes as some police officers in Chicago are also defying the mayor's order to confirm their vaccination status. Here's ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, in California. Across California today, in those boisterous protests, thousands opposing the state's vaccine mandate for students. Some parents preparing to homeschool their kids. I will never vaccinate my kids. Okay. I will never vaccinate. So you would pull them out? I will pull them out. I will quit my job. I will teach them at home if I have to. California teachers are now required to get the shot, and all students will follow as soon as the vaccine is fully approved for their age group. The COVID vaccine joining a list of 10 other vaccines required for California schools, like the measles and mumps. But Lindsay McCoy, who started homeschooling her kids last year, says this vaccine is different. Do you do the MMR vaccines and the polio and all that stuff as well? I am totally pro-vaccine. In general? In general, absolutely. And I think that it's my choice with my doctor. We should have a conversation and decide what, what is necessary for our children. And tonight, across the country, some police officers are also pushing back against vaccine mandates. In Chicago, 35% of the police department's officers haven't reported their vaccination status and risk losing their jobs. I really hope that the men and women of the Chicago Police Department, who have been fed a lot of stuff 
that's the most polite and appropriate word I can use um, in this forum, are not going to ruin their careers over going to website and saying yes or no. Last year, nationwide, 62 percent of all officer deaths in the line of duty were from COVID. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. And now let's bring in Dr. Darian Sutton, an emergency medicine physician and ABC News medical contributor. Great to have you here in person in studio with us. Uh, certainly there is breaking news at this point. The FDA has just made a ruling or a decision about their recommendation as far as mixing and matching the different vaccines. What do they say? So this is incoming data that we're getting minute by minute. And so essentially what we know is that the FDA has approved the Pfizer booster shot, as we know. What it looks like is going to happen very soon in the next couple of days, probably this week, is that they will probably approve Moderna and Johnson & Johnson boosters for those who are eligible. And the most important part, which is the most popular question, they're likely going to allow those who have received a vaccination to, to get another vaccination that is different from their primary vaccination. So that answers that question of, are we going to be allowed to mix and match? But the language is probably going to be very specific, as it probably is altered and specific to the patient, depending on their history, as well as their age and other factors. And let's go back to, to Colin Powell here. We learned today, obviously, that he was double vaccinated, that he was supposed to get that booster shot the week that he got sick. How much of a concern for you is it that that breakthrough infection contributed in part to his death? You know, uh, it is incredibly tragic each and every death that we see succumbing to COVID-19 or, or because of COVID-19. And I have to say that they always concern me, but for specific reasons. Uh, in particular, General Powell and his story, it highlights something very important, which is that we need to continue to protect those who are vulnerable. And by that, I mean those who are elderly and those who are battling a chronic disease that may make them susceptible to infection despite their history of getting vaccinated. And how important now does this put in perspective with him and many others as far as the importance of that booster shot for the most vulnerable among us. It's really important and I want to be clear is that the vaccines are still proving to be effective for the majority of the population. Uh, most recent statistics point out that of the more than 187 million people who have been vaccinated, there have only been approximately 7,000 breakthrough cases that have resulted in a death secondary to COVID-19. So this is a very rare occurrence. But of those 7,000 cases, the majority of those are over the age of 65 and or suffering from a disease that may make them immune compromised, such as multiple myeloma which we now understand is a part of General, uh, excuse me, of General Powell's story. And in everything that we measure as far as COVID-19 is concerned, when we talk about cases, when we talk about hospitalizations and deaths, it seems that we're going in the right direction, all of them on the decline at this point. Uh, but at this point, where would you say we are as far as the trajectory of the virus is concerned as it relates to vaccination rates? I think that we're walking very cautiously but slowly down the hill of COVID-19. I feel very confident in that, not just in the overall numbers, but as a full-time practicing physician in Los Angeles, I have seen very much how the day-to-day -day activity has changed from patients who are coming in symptomatic with COVID-19 to now it's more of a rare occurrence. But we have to be cautious because we're stepping into the winter colder climates where people are going to step indoors and engage in high-risk activity. And we're already seeing in the northern states uh, there are increasing numbers of cases. So we have to be really cognizant of that. If we were to see another variant like Delta hit us, and we saw in Matt, Matt's piece there a little bit ago that there were people who are still protesting vaccines, would you say that enough of the population is vaccinated at this point that we would weather another bout a little better, perhaps? That's a really difficult variable to try to get your hands on when you're trying to extrapolate it to predict the future. What we know is that uncontrolled transmission leads to the development of new variants. We saw it in India when we first had the emergence of the Delta variant. We saw it in the UK when we first had the emergence of the Alpha variant. And what we're seeing in these small pockets is not just vaccine hesitation, but also hesitation about mitigation efforts. And lack of vaccines and lack of mitigation leads to uncontrolled transmission. So I'm really, really, uh, Important. I think it's really important to focus on these communities because they can be a source of future variants that might threaten all of our hard work. Dr. Darian Sutton, we so appreciate you, your insight and you being here with us. Appreciate your time. For several months now, there has been this ongoing chaos in Haiti, and it is now impacting American missionaries who have been kidnapped. Police there say a violent gang is to blame. A U.S. officials are now scrambling to try to rescue them. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Port-au-Prince for us. Tonight, the FBI, now part of the urgent, coordinated effort to rescue 17 members of a Christian organization kidnapped in Haiti, including more than a dozen Americans. A team of U.S. officials on the ground working with senior Haitian authorities to secure their safe release after a gang kidnapped the missionaries on Saturday. 
Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries confirming the 17 kidnapped members include 16 Americans, one Canadian, and five children. The group had just visited this orphanage near Port-au-Prince when Haitian authorities say they were stopped at a checkpoint by one of the country's most notorious gangs, 400 Mawoso. That's their modus operandi. They uh, tend to attack uh, convoys, uh, buses, and, and, and taxis. And so this fits with their uh, pattern of operation. In a newly released statement, the Ohio-based organization tonight asking the public to, quote, join us in prayer that God's grace would sustain the men, women, and children who are being held hostage. By some estimates, those violent gangs now control nearly half of the capital city of Port-au-Prince, terrorizing locals with violent gun battles and those brazen kidnappings. The surge in gang violence further crippling the impoverished nation after the July assassination of its president, Jovenel Moise and an earthquake in August that killed more than 2,200 people and left tens of thousands homeless. Certainly lots of hardship, and now this. Marcus Moore is with us from Port-au-Prince in Haiti. And Marcus, what are you learning from U.S. authorities as they try to help orchestrate this release? Lindsay, we know that according to the White House, President Biden has been receiving regular updates uh, on the situation here. And officials also confirmed that the FBI has made contact with the 400 Mawozo gang, but the exact nature of their communication is unclear. But uh, this is still a very, very delicate situation unfolding here in Port-au-Prince. Lindsay. Marcus, thank you. And when we come back, the horrific sexual assault on a commuter train, and even worse, others on board recorded it but chose to do nothing. A conversation with a queen of hip-hop, MC Light, and her thoughts on breaking through such a male-dominated industry. But up next, it's been more than five years since word of a document compiled by a former British spy looking into possible connections between Donald Trump and Russia captured the imagination of millions. And up next, you will hear from Christopher Steele himself. Stay with us. This is what being live is Three all directions. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A the family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. 
Next to the ABC News exclusive, Christopher Steele, the former British spy behind the controversial Steele dossier, has never done a television interview since it was published. He has never publicly discussed how he was hired and funded by the Clinton campaign to look into connections between Donald Trump and Russia. He's never spoken about the raw intelligence he gathered, particularly the salacious allegations. ABC's George Stephanopoulos recently sat down with him and asked him about the many claims he made, particularly those that remain unproven. How do you respond to critics who say you were doing foreign interference in an American political campaign? We were not foreign interference. The foreign interference in the American political campaign in 2016 was by the Kremlin and the Russian intelligence services. Well, you are British. You're not American. But Britain is America's closest ally. We have always had a track record of helping America. It would have been very curious if what we had chosen to do in 2016 was not to tell them. It would have been unthinkable. Fusion GPS is a corporate investigations firm created by two former reporters for the Wall Street Journal. One was Glenn Simpson. In the spring of 2016, he approached you with a job. What exactly did he ask you to look into? Two things, really. One was what the Russians were doing in terms of potential interference in the campaign, and two, what the links were between Trump and the Trump campaign in Russia. So you get this assignment, what do you do? You essentially get your network of sources to redirect themselves onto asking contacts in Russia about this issue. To ask them to look into what was being said amongst the elite in Russia and the government of the American election. Was there one key source you had for this report? There wasn't one key source, I would say. There was perhaps one key collector. What's a collector? A collector is somebody who obviously works for us directly, is paid for us directly, doesn't necessarily have direct access to information, but knows people who do. You can't name this person, but you met with this person in a European city relatively early on? Yep. What did you learn in that meeting? The contents of Report 080, I think it was, which are well known to the world. There were claims that members of the Trump campaign had coordinated with Russian officials and accepted a steady stream of information on Hillary Clinton and some of Trump's other political rivals. The first report also claims, quote, Trump's unorthodox behavior in Russia over the years had provided the authorities there with enough embarrassing material on him to be able to blackmail him if they so wished. In other words, that the FSB, the Russian security service, had compromised on Donald Trump. Basically, compromise is blackmail in Russian. This was the, I mean, for want of a better word, this is the P-tape. That's part of it, yes. What did he tell you? He relayed several sources, information, sub-sources, information that related to that event. In the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, Correct. 2013. Yep. It would be quite a tape if it, in fact, existed. We are coming on the air now with major news from the Department of Justice. Back against the wall. Move aside. Move aside. Move aside. The acting attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, has decided to appoint a special counsel to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 election. The special counsel will be Robert Mueller. Christopher Steele and his work were conspicuous in their absence from the Mueller report. Along with the investigation that was done by Robert Mueller, a separate report was undertaken by Michael Horowitz, the Inspector General of the Justice Department. The Inspector General also pulled back the curtain on how Steele had gathered his information it doesn't name Steele's collector, but the report does describe some of his methods. And we'd later learn he was not someone well-placed in the Kremlin, but an analyst in Washington. When the FBI sought this person out and interviewed him, he said, yeah, he basically gathered some of this information, but he was almost ambivalent about how accurate it was. Some of this information, including that allegation about the salacious tape, had apparently been gathered from people who had just heard about it or talked about it in jest. One of your main collectors spoke to the inspector general, said that especially the compromise was word of mouth and hearsay, conversations with friends over beers. It was just talk. 
if you have a confidential source and that confidential source is blown or is uncovered, that confidential source will often take fright and try and downplay and underestimate what they've said and done. And I think that's probably what happened here. And today, do you still believe that that tape exists? I think it probably does, but I wouldn't put 100% certainty on it. So you stand by the dossier? I stand by the work we did, the sources that we had, and the professionalism which we applied to it. To see more of this remarkable interview and learn more about that infamous Steele dossier, be sure to watch Out of the Shadows, the man behind the Steele dossier, streaming now on Hulu. Still ahead here on Prime, has China made an astounding advance in their military nuclear technology that has possibly left us far behind? Why California says this year is one for the record books and the discovery of a sword believed to be used by crusaders. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our post of the day. Look at all of those roses surrounding Blink-182 drummer Travis Barker proposing to Kourtney Kardashian. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was going to say. Oh, my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about this is abc news live all right we're gonna move back let's move back we're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter we're on an urgent delivery run with not afraid to go there so my question mr president what are you so afraid of breaking news live events this is the moment Lift off. <laughs> streaming straight to you anytime anywhere you just met one friend right here you're watching abc news live thanks for streaming with us Welcome back, everyone. Now to an amazing discovery. An amateur Israeli scuba diver found a sore that likely belonged to a crusader night almost a millennium ago. We take a look by the numbers. 900 years old, that's the estimated age of this iron sword found in the seabed off the coast of Haifa, Israel. It was encrusted with marine organisms, but otherwise preserved in perfect condition, according to the Israel Antiquities Authority. The roughly four-foot weapon is believed to have been used by a Christian crusader. Starting in the 11th century, leaders of European nations and the Roman Catholic Church sent these crusaders to the Middle East to seize sites that they considered holy from Muslim leaders. The sword was found in a natural anchorage site where archaeologists have found artifacts dating back 4,000 years to the late Bronze Age. This Mediterranean trade route has apparently been used for thousands of years. Israeli authorities called this sword a beautiful and rare find, and they awarded that diver who turned it over to the government with 
a certificate of appreciation for good citizenship. Seems like he could have at least gotten a key to the city of Haifa or something there. More than a certificate, perhaps, for that. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The Biden administration attempts to limit those forever chemicals that we've been reporting on that have been linked to cancer. And parents, listen up. The new warnings reportedly about that Netflix hit Squid Game. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. After four decades of public service, former Secretary of State and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, the first black man to hold each of those positions, died Monday morning due to complications from COVID-19, among other health issues. What an extraordinary public servant, American patriot. May he rest in peace. He served under four presidents, highlighted by his appointment to Secretary of State under President George W. Bush, highly regarded by America's political leaders, receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom twice. His family says he died from complications from COVID-19, this despite the fact that he had been fully vaccinated. Sadly, he was set to receive his booster shot, but hadn't gotten yet. The 84-year-old had also been treated over the past few years for a disease called multiple myeloma, a cancer of plasma cells. We also just learned he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. The Financial Times citing unnamed sources reports that China tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile in August that circled the globe before cruising toward its target. The report says the test caught U.S. intelligence by surprise. The Biden administration not commenting on the report, but a spokesperson for the Pentagon says the U.S. has concerns about the military capabilities China continues to pursue. China denies the report and is claiming it actually launched a spacecraft to test whether it could be reused. A woman had boarded a westbound train on the L headed for the 69th Street station. Police say a woman was sitting alone when a man she did not know, identified as 35-year-old Fiston Noy, sat next to her and tried to start a conversation, that the man tried to touch her sexually, and then that the victim tried several times to push him away. The suspect threw her down, ripped off her clothes, and began to sexually assault her for several minutes. A SEPTA employee then boards the train, sees what is happening, and calls police. Just knowing that we have to ride the train every day, we have to be actually looking for stuff that like that to happen. You know, um, it's, it's kind of scary. Noy was taken into custody. What is startling to police is that there were a number of other people on the train who witnessed the rape and did nothing to stop it. Instead, some of them filmed it and may have put it on social media. There was a lot of people, in my opinion, that should have intervened. Somebody should have done something. Uh, it speaks to where we are in society. I mean, who, who would allow something like that to take place? The state of California recording its driest year in a century amid a dire drought in the West. The Western Regional Climate Center calculated that a total of only 11.87 inches of rain and snow fell in the 2021 water year. That's half the typical average of 23 and a half inches. The last time the state reported so little rain and snowfall was in 1924. 
The wildly popular Netflix series Squid Games has some parents sounding the alarm. According to the Washington Post, our reports of games are popping up on real-life playgrounds around the globe. And while the children aren't using the death penalty, like in the show, there are reports of physical violence. Some schools have asked parents to monitor that their kids do not watch the show and to make sure parental controls are set on their devices. about a homecoming for Candace Parker, the Chicago native joining the sky before the season. She leads her hometown team to its first WNBA title. Parker couldn't contain her emotions as the game was ending. It feels amazing. I mean, my high school coach is here. I know Pat's watching. I mean, I got the whole city here. We got the whole city here. And it's just amazing how Chicago supports. I mean, we're champions for life now. To Washington now, where the EPA today announced a new strategy to address potentially toxic man-made chemicals called PFAS that have been found to pose risks to human health. We've done some in-depth reporting here on the contamination in drinking water systems and the growing calls for regulation. And tonight, the Biden administration says it is moving forward. Senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer joins us now. And Devin, of course, you've reported extensively on PFAS. Uh, just give us a sense of the problem once again. And what does the EPA say? that they plan to do. Lindsay, well, these per and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances, or PFAS, are a class of chemicals. They're man-made, tasteless, colorless, and they're everywhere in our, our daily lives, and they're largely unregulated by the EPA. They're called forever chemicals because they don't break down in the environment. They're found uh, on everything from our waterproof jackets to furniture to uh, spill-proof food packaging uh, to firefighting foams found at airports. And the problem is when these chemicals get inside our bodies, mostly through drinking contaminated drinking water. Scientists have found links to liver damage, uh, high cholesterol, weakened immune systems, cancer from prolonged consumption. So the EPA a few years ago issued an advisory about consuming PFAS, but there's no mandatory safety limit, and they don't test for it uh, in water systems around the United States. So today, the EPA issued a three-year plan, they called it a roadmap, to track, limit, and clean up PFAS pollution in the years ahead, and they'll more immediately require the makers of these chemicals to report data so they know just how toxic they are. Lindsay. So would you say that this move is significant? or does this actually fall short of what environmental groups have been calling for? Well, a number of groups I heard from today, Lindsay, consumer advocates said this is a positive first step. You know, this has been a campaign promise for years by presidents and administrations of both parties, but the EPA has been studying this issue for decades, literally. Uh, in fact, the Trump administration promised to regulate PFAS in the drinking water. Andrew Wheeler told us here on ABC News Live a few years ago, that uh, was the Trump EPA administrator, that he was ready to set safety limits. None of that happens. So PFAS now is in the water systems in 49 of 50 states. Uh, the science around the health impacts of consuming these chemicals is becoming uh, much clearer. One environmental group today, Lindsay, uh, blasted this Biden plan as a dud for not going far enough quickly enough. But EPA Administrator Michael Reagan at an event announcing this proposal today assured people that, quote, we will deliver protections for people who are hurt. So we'll see if that comes through, Lindsay. But a lot of people are plugging in now to this issue of PFAS. Lindsay. And it sounds like, for the most part, that voice is saying that this is a step in the right direction by and large. That's right. Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. Thanks, Lindsay. And now to one of the first female trailblazers of hip hop, MC Light. Light exploded onto the scene in the late 1980s with her critically acclaimed album, Light as a Rock. Since then, she's released a total of eight studio albums. Not only is she considered one of the best female hip hop artists of all time, but also one of the most influential in the genre. Her story and rise to stardom will be highlighted in tonight's ABC special, The Real Queens of Hip Hop, the women who changed the game, along with many other artists who've transformed hip hop. Here's a sneak peek at Light's spoken word performance. We persevere, becoming greater creators without pulling favors. Showing up, showing out, proving we could be braver. Exceeding all expectations, claiming our rightful spot in this culture called hip hop.
Joining us now is MC Light herself. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, I have to say that I've, I've had the song Roughneck in my head all day just knowing that I was going to get the chance to talk with you. So tell me about the influence of your mom as you were growing up and her stressing the importance of essay writing and the impact that that had on your lyrics. Absolutely. Well, she studied to be a teacher and I was her, her student. I was her pupil and she would, it was simple things, you know, um, in the morning I'd come into the restroom. She goes, how you doing? And I go fine. And she goes, fine isn't good enough. How about you go to the thesaurus and you find another word. And so every day I had to come up with another word to, you know, explain what it was that I was feeling. And as we saw in tonight's special, you have a spoken word performance, a type of poetry style that you are now famous for. Explain to us how you think spoken word has influenced hip hop culture? Oh boy, I still think that spoken word is the least tampered with when it comes to a message that needs to come through, um, mostly from the streets or from the community, because there's no one that sort of has a tally on it that you can't say this and you can't say that. So you can really just come from the heart and, and put it all out there. And with spoken word, you're allowed to just go into areas of sentiment that aren't necessarily accepted in hip hop. Uh, so you can be vulnerable and you can be powerful, you can be strong, but there's all of these areas that you can touch. And so to, to be asked by uh, Fatima Curry, the director, to do these spoken word pieces, it was, was right up my alley. I started with spoken word uh, at 12, writing in a notebook. And most of my first album was actually uh, it hailed from poetry in the book that we just eventually put to music. Hey, you're considered one of the first pioneers for female rappers. How hard was it for you to push through this male-dominated hip-hop scene, and how did you do it? Well, it was absolutely uh, not difficult at all because I wasn't thinking about it. I just was along for the ride. I was doing what I knew how to do, and that was come from the heart about subjects and topics that were uh, facing and plaguing my generation. But I will say that although I'm looked upon as a legend or a trailblazer, of course there was Shaw Rock from the Funky 4 Plus One More that I heard first, and Pebbly Poo, and Sparky D, and Rock. Roxanne Shante and the real Roxanne and Salt and Pepper and so many that had come before me. But I'm, I'm happy to be here today doing what I love. And as women continue to contribute to hip hop music, the critique often discussed is how sexualization of women in the genre persists, whether it's through explicit lyrics or physical appearance. Uh, what are your thoughts about the music by female rappers of today and how that often differs from back in the day when there was often this social consciousness or playful aspect to the lyrics without being as explicit? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, you know what's What's funny is while you were asking, and I, I was thinking to myself, it's changed for men as well. It may not be That's aesthetically, true. but certainly, you know, what it is that's being said. I remember I had never heard anyone use the B word until I, you know, I went out west and I heard someone say the word B. You know, I was just like, oh my goodness, I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine hearing Rakim or, you know, KRS One, Heavy D, Fresh Prince. They would never use language like that to talk about a sister. It, it just didn't make sense to me. But as it relates to women in hip hop, uh, it's like showgirls. You know, I feel like when I, I watch a show that I'm at the Rockettes, you know. Uh, I also said the other day, if I were uh, to perform somewhere, it would, I would really feel old school because I'd have pants on. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think any of them <laughs> perform with pants. It's like no longer the style. If you've got leg, you've got to show it. But the truth is, this is where we are everywhere in life. It's not just hip hop music. We've got to remember that the youngins that come out of hip hop now are just a reflection of what's happening in their communities, what it is that they're seeing on TV, what it is that they're being inspired by is what is pushing and propelling them to to come out, say the things they say, look the way they look. I mean, I was a I was a reflection of Caribbean culture in Brooklyn, New York. So that's why I had the asymmetrical haircut. <laughs> the big baggy clothes, the big earrings. People thought that that I came up with that style. No, all of my Jamaicans, Haitians, Bayesians, Barbadians, Guyanese, they were all in Brooklyn and I just 
you know, took their style because that's where I live. That's what it was. So I think it's just um, life, life dictating art. Right, a, a sign of the time, certainly. And, and before we go, I want to give viewers a taste of the special tonight. Take a look at a clip. Man, what have women in hip hop given to the culture? Everything. Why is it important that stories of pioneering women in hip hop are told and explored in specials like tonight's The Real Queens of Hip Hop? And, and what do you think that the future of women in hip hop and, and hip hop in general is going to look like? Oh, goodness. Well, first off, I would say we do have a real queens of hip hop in the queen show. So that's not to get confused because we're saying real the, sh the documentary is called Real Queens, that there aren't any in the show. Eve, by far, is, is certainly a hip hop queen uh, from Philly repping. Thank you, uh, Eve, for all of what you do. And I'm so glad that you have this opportunity on the show. Where do I think... Uh, hip hop is headed for female MCs, and why is it important that the legacy be told? Because it's very easy to forget. It's very easy to be in the now and not recognize all of those that came before. And if we make the decision to stop talking about them, then they will be forgotten. Well, you know, someone like Sparky D that came on the scene so hard and hit hard, and then we didn't hear from her, it's very easy for this generation to know nothing of her if we don't speak of her. So I just think that the history is important uh, for any genre, but specifically for hip hop, because I'm a part of it, I'd say that it's important because there were so many women that brought so much knowledge and wisdom and power to hip hop, and many of the men in hip hop know that they were inspired and influenced by some of the women. And I think it's important that they also tell the story, story too, of how much women in hip hop mean to the genre. MC Light, thank you so much for your time. Truly a pleasure having you on. ABC special, The Real Queens of Hip Hop, The Women Who Changed the Game, airs tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on ABC and tomorrow on demand and on Hulu. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. Flags are at half spit staff at government buildings for the boundary-breaking former military leader and diplomat Colin Powell. President Biden today said he embodied the highest ideals of both warrior and diplomat. From his humble beginnings in Harlem and the South Bronx to becoming the first black secretary of state, we would also say he embodied the American dream. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of several things, including lawmakers are now back in Washington, but are Democrats any closer to coming together for that reconciliation infrastructure bill? And our journey to the Michigan town, where something as simple as clean water is now a hot commodity. Stay with us. This is what being live is Three all directions. about. Right, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. 
The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. He is being remembered as a trailblazer. Colin Powell, the first black Joint Chief of Staff and the first black Secretary of State, died today from COVID complications. He was fully vaccinated, but has been privately battling a rare blood blood cancer. He's remembered for his service, but also for paving the way for the U.S. war in Iraq with a famous speech to the U.N. in 2003, which he later publicly regretted and said would feature prominently in his obituary. Powell, a diplomat, soldier, and patriot, was 84 years old. Actor Cuba Gooding Jr. will stay on trial on February 1st on charges that he groped women in Manhattan bars or nightclubs in 2018 and 2019. The announcement was made today. Gooding has pled not guilty to misdemeanor forcible touching and sexual abuse charges. Former President Trump sat for a videotaped deposition today in a lawsuit involving his anti-immigrant rhetoric back in 2015. This all stems from a group of protesters of Mexican origin who were protesting outside Trump Tower, allegedly being violently attacked by security guards, including then-candidate Trump's longtime bodyguard. Trump's deposition could become public. Now to the latest on that mass kidnapping of American missionaries in Haiti and the urgent effort to get them released. 17 people, including 16 American missionaries and family members, abducted after visiting an orphanage. Now the U.S. government says they're working with Haitian authorities. ABC's Marcus Moore is on the ground for us in Haiti and files this report. Tonight, the FBI, now part of the urgent, coordinated effort to rescue 17 members of a Christian organization kidnapped in Haiti, including more than a dozen Americans. A team of U.S. officials on the ground working with senior Haitian authorities to secure their safe release after a gang kidnapped the missionaries on Saturday. Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries confirming the 17 kidnapped members include 16 Americans, one Canadian, and five children. The group had just visited this orphanage near Port-au-Prince when Haitian authorities say they were stopped at a checkpoint by one of the country's most notorious gangs, 400 Mawoso. That's their modus operandi. They uh, tend to attack uh, convoys, uh, buses, and, and, and taxis. And so this fits with their uh, pattern of operation. In a newly released statement, the Ohio-based organization tonight asking the public to, quote, join us in prayer that God's grace would sustain the men, women, and children who are being held hostage. By some estimates, those violent gangs now control nearly half of the capital city of Port-au-Prince, terrorizing locals with violent gun battles and those brazen kidnappings. The surge in gang violence further crippling the impoverished nation after the July assassination of its president, Jovenel Moise. And an earthquake in August that killed more than 2,200 people and left tens of thousands homeless. Our thanks to Marcus for that. And now to Washington and the ongoing battle in Congress among Democrats to reach a deal on President Biden's domestic agenda after delaying action on those major infrastructure bills earlier this month. Congress is now back in session this week. So for the very latest, let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Thanks so much for joining us, Rick. First, just give us a lay of the land on, on where things stand right now on the two major bills on infrastructure, both the traditional bill focused on roads and bridges and the larger social spending package that tackles everything from early childhood childhood education to health care to climate change. What are the sticking points here? And are moderates and progressives any closer to getting a deal? 
Lindsay, this is still about getting Democrats on the same page, and they are still miles apart in terms of the price tag. And the sticking points now involve some particular programs, particularly some climate policies that uh, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia is skeptical around. Uh, he's also very, very cognizant of making, uh, making some of these programs means-tested to say that higher income people wouldn't be eligible for them. But the big question really remains now, Lindsay, do Democrats try to do a lot of things with smaller number of years and smaller eligibility thresholds, or do they try to do a few things and do them bigger? That's how you get to a smaller price tag. You have to lose either the number of programs or how long or who's eligible for those programs. And that's the existential question for Democrats right now. Which of those paths do they choose? And the negotiations have been ongoing behind closed doors, but they're no closer to a resolution at this hour. And with so much of the Biden agenda hanging in the balance right now, you wrote today that this isn't just about convincing the different factions of the Democratic Party to agree, but it's also about convincing voters on their plans. Are Democrats falling short on that? In a word, no, Lindsay. And this is really what worries Democrats politically is they think, a lot of them think, that they'll get there when it comes to infrastructure and social spending, that they'll approve bills uh, eventually, but that they're going to be defined in the negative by what they don't do, also by their price tag. And uh, a really alarming statistic that was in one national poll last week, only 25 percent, one quarter of Americans think that these packages are going to make their lives better. We're talking about the largest expansion in social programs in history. And to see that only a quarter of the country thinks it's going to help them, that's a problem for Democrats. So they're very keen on passing this, but also on selling this. And we're going to see President Biden in his hometown of Scranton later in the week with a televised town hall the next day. He is trying to do what he can to, to break out some individual pieces of these, of these plans and say, this is what it's going to mean for average Americans working as marketer in chief at this point. And Speaker Pelosi has set a target of getting a deal done by Halloween on these bills. Is that realistic or could this push into the holiday months and the other budget deadlines that are looming in December? Yeah, there's no way. I mean, look, forget your trick-or-treat plans if you're a Congress watcher. It's not going to happen <laughs> by Halloween. It's possible that they have a framework at least in the next 10 days or so, but it is not realistic to think that all of the, the I's are going to be uh, dotted and the T's are going to be crossed in the space of just 10 days. Like so many of these other deadlines, they're essentially artificial deadlines, but what's not artificial, Lindsay, is that you've got a debt ceiling that once again is going to come upon Congress in December. You also have government funding, of another possibility of a shutdown. Those are hard deadlines. So really, Democrats want to get these other packages done before they have to deal again with those things that they can't move, like a possible government shutdown and a default on the national debt. They can wear a costume into Congress that day as a signed infrastructure bill, <laughs> something we may only see as a costume. Political Director Rick Klein, we thank you so much. Thanks, and Lindsay. While the Biden administration continues to push their agenda through a Congress their own party controls, they also need to do something about the growing backlog in the supply chain. Now, last week, the president announced new measures with ports and shippers aimed at easing all the strain, but real impacts could still be months away. And that's why our Martha Raddatz recently traveled to one of the nation's busiest ports to see the problem firsthand. Here off the coast of Southern California, on the waters of the country's busiest ports, record numbers of container ships sitting idle. Right now in the port of Long Beach, there are more than 60 container ships anchored here waiting to unload. Normally, there wouldn't be any of them waiting, and those are just the ones you can see. Way out in the Pacific, there are dozens more. On board these ships, that couch you order, computers, refrigerators, medical supplies, and toys, hoping to reach Santa in time for Christmas. Martha, I have never seen anything like this. This is actually one of the smaller ships. The largest ships in service today can carry up to 24,000 container units. And what would that mean in terms of goods? That could fill three shopping malls. Long Beach Port's Deputy Executive Director, Noel Hasegaba, said it all began with COVID. Was this something that just wasn't planned for? Well, the pandemic, had the effect of impacting every segment of the supply chain. When manufacturing was shut down in Asia, we had very little business here. Starting in July, we noticed this surge, this tsunami of cargo. So we went from doom and gloom to fast and furious on a term of a dime, and that caught the supply chain off guard. When the economy began showing signs of improvement, consumer demand, online shopping already thriving, grew as well. The Port of Los Angeles is averaging around 900,000 containers per month, projecting 10.8 million this year, a 17% increase from 2020. 
with no signs of incoming ships slowing down. But even if they are lucky enough to get into the port, Hello! they sit and wait in this cargo campground. You've been here for a month? Yes. Long time. It's taking three times longer to clear vessels at the ports compared to before the pandemic. And the Long Beach port is already working 24-7. Start to order now. To Matt Schrapp, CEO of the Harbor Trucking Association, says working 24-7 won't solve everything. The challenge is space on the one hand and then enough vessels capacity that's available to move those containers back to their point of origin. Backlogged, empty containers contributing to a shortage around the world, dramatically increasing the cost of shipping. From China to the U.S., roughly $1,300 to more than $16,000. What took an average of 41 days now takes 75. Adding to strained operations at the ports, there's labor shortages at every step in the supply chain from the longshoremen to warehouse workers to what could be the most dire, a need for tens of thousands of truck drivers nationwide. We've had a worker shortage on truck drivers now long before we had a record-breaking cargo. That has been a huge issue. You've Mayor Robert been, Garcia, uh, who has uh, been working with the administration, hopes the backlog will ease in his city's port in the next few weeks. But others predict it could take months or even far longer. The best estimates that I've heard, th this could be something that will be well into next Christmas, to be honest with you. And as all these supply chain issues come to a head, they are hitting retailers and consumers directly. Inflation for the month of September hit 5.4% over the past year, matching a 13-year high. Prices have increased for items like new cars, TVs, gas, food, and furniture. Wendy Ortiz, owner of Caravana Furniture in Long Beach, told me manufacturers are continuing to increase prices and delivery times have been unprecedented. It used to take about two to three days. Now, it's, sometimes it's taking a month. I even had a client that was waiting almost a year to get her furniture. Sparking fears for holiday shopping. Heather Rasmussen, owner of Pixie Toys, feels prepared for the holiday season, but said she's already had parents shop for Christmas. As a parent, I would say don't panic buy, but just make sure that you're prepared with everything that you need. Our thanks to Martha for that report. And now to the ABC News exclusive. The former British spy behind the infamous Steele dossier investigating possible links between then-candidate Donald Trump and Russia. That spy is now speaking for the first time. What he says about the most notorious claims in his report, our Jonathan Carl reports. Christopher Steele, the former British spy who set off a political firestorm in the United States about Donald Trump's alleged ties to Russia, is now speaking out in public for the first time in an exclusive interview with George Stephanopoulos. Give me a declarative sentence. Christopher Steele is? A patriot, um, somebody who has professional integrity and expertise, and somebody who is a true friend and ally of the United States. Steele authored the infamous Steele dossier. It presented some allegations about Russian interference which proved to be accurate, but others, including a salacious claim that the Russians may have had a video of Trump watching prostitutes in a Moscow hotel room, are either unproven or discredited. An investigation by the Justice Department's Inspector General showed that the source who gave Steele some of his key material, a Washington analyst, told the FBI much of it was rumor and speculation, including the supposed videotape recorded by Russia to blackmail Trump, what's known in Russia as Kompromat. One of your main collectors spoke to the inspector general, said that especially the Kompromat was word of mouth and hearsay, conversations with friends over beers, it was just talk. If you have a confidential source and that confidential source is blown or is uncovered, that confidential source will often take fright and try and downplay and underestimate what they've said and done. And I think that's probably what happened here. Steele says he believes the video probably exists, but Trump and his allies say it was all designed to destroy his presidency before it even started. It's phony stuff. It didn't happen. But tonight, Christopher Steele defends his work. 
So you stand by the dossier? I stand by the work we did, the sources that we had, and the professionalism which we applied to it. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. And now to the COVID-19 pandemic. As the number of cases and hospitalization in the U.S. appear to improve, the standoff over mask and vaccine mandates intensifies. From California, where parents are protesting COVID vaccine requirements for students, to Chicago, where the city's police force is pushing back against a vaccine policy. ABC's Matt Gutman is tracking it all. Across California today in those boisterous protests, thousands opposing the state's vaccine mandate for students. Some parents preparing to homeschool their kids. I will never vaccinate my kids. Okay. I will never vaccinate. So you would pull them out? I will pull them out. I will quit my job. I will teach them at home if I have to. California teachers are now required to get the shot, and all students will follow as soon as the vaccine is fully approved for their age group. The COVID vaccine joining a list of 10 other vaccines required for California schools, like the measles and mumps. But Lindsay McCoy, who started homeschooling her kids last year, says this vaccine is different. Do you do the MMR vaccines and the polio and all that stuff as well? I am totally pro-vaccine. In general? In general. Absolutely, and I think that it's my choice with my doctor. We should have a conversation and decide what, what is necessary for our children. And tonight, across the country, some police officers are also pushing back against vaccine mandates. In Chicago, 35% of the police department's officers haven't reported their vaccination status and risk losing their jobs. I really hope that the men and women of the Chicago Police Department, who have been fed a lot of stuff, that's the most polite and appropriate word I can use um, in this forum, are not going to ruin their careers over going to a website and saying yes or no. Last year, nationwide, 62% of all officer deaths in the line of duty were from COVID. And Lindsay, the New York Times is now reporting that the FDA is considering allowing providers the discretion which vaccine they will give their patients. Now, they're not going to recommend one vaccine over the other, and they are going to recommend that the booster match the original vaccine. Lindsay. Matt, thank you. And one more note to pass along. The NHL has suspended San Jose Sharks forward Evander Kane for 21 games. They did so after he allegedly submitted a fake COVID-19 vaccination card. Next to the newest water crisis in the state of Michigan, the governor there ordering all lead pipes to be replaced in the town of Benton Harbor, which has been plagued by lead and water for years. Zachary Keish has more on what this town is doing and how some of this could be solved if Congress passes an infrastructure bill. Benton Harbor is fighting a lead water crisis. Over the past few days, semis rolling into town delivering approximately 30,000 bottles of water a week are creating distribution lines that look like this all over town. I appreciate the free water. Some distribution places where they're giving the water out, I've waited an hour and a half to two hours. Just days ago, Michigan Governor Whitmer signed an executive order to provide free bottled water to residents. But the issue has put a spotlight on leadership at every level. As the mayor, I have to own it. Dr. Hannah Atisha, a pediatrician who signed the petition here and helped elevate the issues in Flint, just three hours away. Lead is a neurotoxin. It has no safe level. Um, you know, any amount of lead can potentially alter the life course trajectory of not just one kid, but, but a population of children. About 6,000 pipes need to be replaced in Benton Harbor. It will require time and money. It was an amber color. It was sizzling like, have you heard Alka-Seltzer? Emma Kennard, an educator and lifelong resident, bottled that water back in 2018 and brought it to city officials. She says a lot of folks around here fear speaking up or don't have the education to do it. A coalition of community leaders led by activist and, and Reverend created. Pinckney asked the federal government to step in, filing an emergency petition to the Environmental Protection Agency. What can you do with the water around here? Nothing but pay the water bill. The city, which is predominantly black, with a median household income of 21,000, according to 2019 census data, is not unlike other poor, majority non-white cities when it comes to disparities in clean water access. According to ABC's Equity Report released last month, one in every four of America's poor zip codes has at least one district with excessive lead contamination. 
compared to one in every 11 of America's wealthiest zip codes, where median household income is more than 75000 They allow the, the people in this community to drink this water for over three years without saying a mumbling word. Why is that okay? It's not okay because this should not happen to any city. Our thanks to Zachary Keish. And still to come, why protesters disrupted the torchlighting ceremony for the upcoming Beijing Games and Colin Powell in his own words. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Right, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A the family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Human rights activists unfurled a banner reading no genocide games as they called for a boycott of the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics during the torch lighting ceremony. Protesters waved a Tibetan flag. Some activists were quickly led away by police. More protests are being planned in the hopes of postponement and relocation of the games. As the world's worst hunger crisis in a decade devastates the Tigray region, children suffering from severe malnourishment are being treated in hospitals where patients have not been given meat, eggs, or milk since June, and on some days, they get nothing to eat. The man-made famine follows a year of war. The head of the World Health Organization estimates as many as 400,000 people are living in famine-like conditions. The arraignment for a close ally of Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro was held in a federal court in Miami. Alex Saab is a businessman accused of laundering money on behalf of the Venezuelan government. Saab was arrested in Cape Verde while making a stop on the way to Iran for what Maduro's government later claimed was a diplomatic humanitarian mission that gives him immunity from prosecution. U.S. prosecutors believe Saab could be the most significant witness into corruption in the South American country. Next tonight, China is denying reports that they have tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile that would be an astounding advance in their military technology and possibly leave the U.S. far behind. The development opening up a new front in the 21st century arms race. Our James Longman reports. Tonight, China denying reports it test-fired a hypersonic missile, technology that would allow it to fire a nuclear warhead faster than anyone else. Britain's Financial Times saying Beijing test launched the weapon this summer, sending it into space and around the planet before it landed just 25 miles away from its intended target. 
Hypersonic glide weapons can fly five times the speed of sound and lower than conventional weapons. The U.S. does not currently have the ability to even track this weapon, much less defeat it. It will give the Chinese the ability to conduct a nuclear strike anywhere in the world without warning. The U.S. and Russia are also developing this capability, but it's thought they're far behind China in this particular weapons race. The report, which can't be independently verified by ABC News, says that U.S. intelligence services had no idea that China was so far ahead. China denies it was a hypersonic missile, calling it instead a routine test of a reusable spacecraft. But all this does is add to US concerns about China's nuclear buildup. Lindsay? James, thank you. And finally tonight, as we remember Colin Powell, Powell would often speak of the 13 rules to live by. We found them in his own words. Here's David Muir. Colin Powell sharing this image just a few years back, a selfie he took in the 1950s when he shared it writing, I was doing selfies 60 years before the rest of you. Over the years, Colin Powell would often speak of 13 rules to live by. In his memoir, It Worked For Me, he went down the list. It ain't as bad as you think. It will look better in the morning. Get mad, then get over it. Avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. It can be done. Be careful what you choose. You may get it. Don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision. You can't make someone else's choices. You shouldn't let someone else make yours. Check small things. Share credit. Remain calm. Be kind. Have a vision. Be demanding. Don't take counsel of your fears or naysayers. Perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. Remain calm and be kind. Our thanks to David for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories.